Amen. Well, the Lord is good. Can you say amen? amen? Hallelujah. Red clay is going to be something different. It's going to be, we've never had a fellowship on a Wednesday night. Well, we might have, but we've never gone away from the church. This is going to be like a picnic. We're going to have hamburgers, hot dogs. Uh, so it's like a giant swimming pool there. It's actually a spring-fed deal with concrete all in it and so forth. Beautiful place. And so it's going to be something different. Then our movie night, we'll, sh we'll show you a recent Christian movie, probably one you've never seen. Which one, I'm not sure now but yet. We have several to choose from, but it'll be good. And we'll have popcorn here. Glory to God. Amen. John's, o John's over there twitching already. <laughs> We're just teasing him. Praise God. Amen. But it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And, uh, and we look forward to all those events coming up. Can you say amen? amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you excited about God? Yes. Amen. Me too. Praise God. Regardless of what's going on in the world, Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords. God's still on the throne. His word is still the truth. And we're walking in victory and we're walking on all the blessings that rightfully belong to us in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? Amen. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Yes. Verse number 17. 2 Corinthians 5, verse number 17. Glory to God. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, anyone that's born again is in Christ, that in Christ, of course, means a lot of different things, but in Christ for our purposes this morning just means you've been born again. If you're born again, you're in Christ. I like what uh, Paul said in Romans 16, 7. He said, Greet Andronicus and Junia, Junia, my countrymen and my fellow prisoners who were of note among the apostles and who were in Christ before me. He uses that term in Christ to mean they, they became Christians before I did. So if you're a Christian, you're in Christ. If anyone is in Christ, it says, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Amen. If anyone is in Christ, he is. Say, I am. I am. A new creation. <laughs> I like that new. New here means something that never existed before. It's brand new. And it carries with it the attitude new here in the Greek, the idea of it's, it's something that's far superior. So you're a new creation. You're something that's, that's never been seen before, something that never existed before, something that's brand new. It's not something that's been fixed, not something that's been improved or restored or repaired or rehabilitated. When you got born again, you just didn't get fixed. No, the old man passed away and you became something brand new. Glory to God. As Christians, we haven't just been fixed we're not just forgiven sinners. No, 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 no. We're not just fixed. We're not just repaired. We're not just restored. There was nothing to fix. There was nothing to rehabilitate. We were by nature sinners. You know the old saying, you know, you can't fix stupid. Well, you can't fix a sinner. He is what he is. He sins because he is a sinner by nature. No, he has to be born again. Something brand new has to come along. Glory to God. We were sinners by nature. We were what the Bible calls spiritually dead and separated from God. In the natural world, you know, you say, we say you can't fix or change the nature of something. A leopard can't change his spots. In other words, it's his innate nature to be a leopard, to have spots. It's his inner nature to have spots because he is a leopard. He has a leopard nature and leopard life on the inside of him. Well, it's the sinner's nature to sin. And no man can change his own nature. No man can. No man can, but God can. And God did, can you say amen? amen. Glory to God. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we just didn't turn over a new light, leaf. We just didn't become a better version of our old selves. We didn't progressively get better and better and better because we decided to do right. No, we're not just forgiven sinners with the same old nature we always had. No, God created us a brand new, never seen before, far superior new creation. Amen. Glory to God. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Even the word creation is interesting in this verse. Here it means just like when God created the universe. He didn't take something old and make it new. You know, out of, out of nothing, God created the universe. He brought about something that was truly brand new. And when you were born again on the inside, 
You know, you were born again on the inside. It was your inner nature that was changed. You, you didn't, you know, your, your looks didn't change outwardly. Isn't that right? You know, no, it was on the inside this took place. The real you, the man on the inside, your spiritual nature was changed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then it says, old things have passed away. He's not talking about beer and cigarettes and stuff like that. He's talking about the old things of your spirit, your old sin nature that was dead, that was separated from God. Your, your inner nature, that old spiritual nature, your old satanic sin nature that was dead and separated from God or alienated from the life of God. Amen. The thing that made you a sinner is what passed away. And the idea in the Greek is it, ha it passed away permanently. Glory to God, the person you used to be. Your old nature is dead. It's gone. It will never be seen again. It's passed away forever and ever. Hallelujah. And you were created a brand new spiritually. You were created brand new spiritually on the inside with the very life of God on the inside of you, the very nature of God on the inside of you. Amen. So when he says old things passed away, he means spiritually. You still have the same body you always had. If you were fat before you got saved, you're still. <laughs> Unless you lost weight. <laughs> Amen. No, you still got the same body and the body still wants to do some of the same old things that it used to do. But that's not you. That's not your nature anymore. He says, behold. Well, you could go into the Greek, but just to put it in modern day translation, you know, we might say it this way. When Paul says, behold, he says, behold, he says, wow, this is amazing. Something extraordinary has happened. Wow, behold, all things have become new. Become new in the Greek, the word become actually means suddenly, instantly. It's not something that progressively took place. No, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God did something for you that you could never do on your own through your own human efforts and self-striving and trying to be good enough and so forth. God instantly changed your nature. So a leopard can't change his spots, but a sinner can change his nature by accepting Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. So again, we don't progressively rehabilitate our old nature. <laughs> there was nothing to rehabilitate. It was, it was a sin nature. No, we take Jesus as the Lord and Savior and God instantly, we become instantly, suddenly created us. God he created us a brand new person on the inside. And it's very important, very important. Just say, like I know this. Listen, it's very important that you know this in order to live by faith, to have a relationship with God, to have fellowship with God, to overcome sin and to overcome the devil. Amen. It's important that we know that we acknowledge that we are a new creation. In other words, quit looking at yourself from the natural viewpoint. Quit thinking of yourself as a failure. Quit identifying with your past. Quit identifying with your, with your old sin nature. Don't let your fleshly mistakes and behavior define you. Amen. But see yourself, view yourself, as a new creation in Christ Jesus, a brand new person with a brand new nature that Satan has no power over, that sin has no power over, glory to God, that demons have no power over, glory to God. So you have to acknowledge that. It's important that you acknowledge that. It's important that you see that. It's important that you believe that. And it's important that you confess or say that you're a brand new person. Say it with me. Say, I'm a new creation. All things inside of me passed away. All things inside of me became brand new. I have new life. I have a new nature. God's life and nature is in me. I don't care what my flesh says. I hold fast my confession. I am a new creation. Amen. You know, Brother Hagin said in... in and talking about after he was, you know, he was born sickly and always sick. And then he ended up on his deathbed and was there for almost a year and a half, you know. And so after he was raised off the deathbed, he tells a little interesting story. He said, I was healed on a Tuesday. You know, and while he was on that deathbed, he, you know, he'd been a church member, but he had never been born again. And he got, well, he got saved. He said, that Saturday I walked to town and I happened to run into a friend of mine. We had been best buddies. 
But during six, the 16 months I had been bedfast, he had seen me only once. He was the same old creature, the same old creation he had always been, but I'd become a new creation. He laughed about the things we used to do. Pointing to a building down the street, he said, remember that night? And he went on to talk about the time I had picked the lock on the door so some boys could go in and steal candy. I sat there with a mask-like look on my face like I didn't know what he was talking about. <clears throat> I remembered it well enough, but I wanted to use this as an opportunity to witness to him. He said, what's the matter with you? You act like you don't remember, and you were the ringleader. Lefty, the fellow you were with that night is dead. You're not dead. I know you almost died, but you're not dead. That's you sitting right there. Oh, I said, you're looking at the house I live in. You're looking at my body. The man on the inside who gave permission to the body to pick that lock is dead and gone. And the man on the inside is now a new creature in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. And that's so of all of us. Glory to God. And as, as a brand new creation, we've been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Tells us so right here in, in this same passage in verse number 21. It says, for he, that's God, he made him Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Well, you know, there's, we're not teaching on righteousness this morning, but there's many, many scriptures that tell us that we're justified or righteous because of Jesus Christ. You know, justified just as if I never sinned. Quit identifying as sinner. Quit identifying with, with your sinful mistakes. That's not who you are. Glory to God. Glory to God. It's just like we never sinned. Our past is gone. In Hebrews 10, 16 and 17, God says of Christians, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sin and iniquities will I remember no more. Our nature has changed. You know, that's why Jesus talked to the Pharisees the way he did because, you know, you could outwardly Act like you love somebody, but on the inside, be full of strife or envy or jealousy or hate toward that person. Well, is that love? Even though you're doing the right thing? No. It's from the inside out. When you're born again, the love of God is shed or brought in your heart by the Holy Ghost. And so you let that love manifest. It automatically will manifest into the right kind of behavior that treats people the right way. Then that's, that's true love. That's real love. It comes from the inside out. It has to come from the inside out because there are a lot of moral sinners because of societal restraints. Pretend like it's 1950 and I said that. Because of societal restraints, there are a lot of moral sinners. There's people that are moral because if they're not, they'll go to jail. But they're not righteous. They're not, they're, by nature, they are sinners. It's got to be from the inside out. So God says, I'll put my laws into their hearts where I'll change their nature so that they'll want to do the right things. And I'll remember their sins and iniquities no more. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. When we were created a brand new creation, our sins were blotted out. They were wiped out, not just covered like they were under the Old Testament. You know, their sins were, were covered by the blood of bulls and lambs and goats, but our sins were washed away by the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and we became a, like a newborn baby. You know, 1 Peter 2, 2, say, 2, 2 says, as newborn babes, talking about Christians, calls them newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. All that we used to be was blotted out. Amen. Our past is blotted out. God doesn't remember anything that we did that was evil. He, you know, he doesn't remember that old sinner. Glory, he doesn't hold anything against us. Glory to God. When you see a new baby, do you think about them having a wicked past? I mean, you know, they've just, they just been born just a week or so, and you, you don't think about their past. They're, they're, they don't have a past. And sometimes you'll say, look at that little innocent thing. <laughs> as a new creation in Christ Jesus, that's the way God sees you, as an innocent little baby. You are innocent. Yeah, but I don't feel, I don't care how you feel. You are innocent because God says you are because you are a brand new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away suddenly and instantly when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. And, you know, if, if, we, if we miss it after we sin, 1 John 1, 9 tells us what to do. It says if we confess our sins, He, that's God, is faithful and just to forgive us 
and cleanse us, amen, of all unrighteousness. So if you make a mistake as a Christian, you trip over your flesh, you know, and you sin, you say something you shouldn't say, do something you shouldn't do. When you confess your sin, how long do you think it takes God to forgive you? Huh? I mean, sometimes we don't forgive ourselves for a week or two because we're trying to pay for what we did wrong. There's only one person that could pay the penalty for sin. That was Jesus Christ. No, so when we for confess our sins, he instantly forgives us and cleanses us. I like that. And cleanses us. Amen. And so as brand new creations, new creatures in Christ who are cleansed, we can enter into God's presence just like we never sinned. Listen carefully to me. People who don't understand this, and there are many, people who don't understand this don't believe God will help them too much. They don't believe God will answer their prayers too much. They don't believe God will do anything for them too much. And they are very hesitant to use their faith because God, God, wouldn't, you know, God wouldn't use me. God wouldn't let me do something. So they are greatly hindered. But the truth makes us free. Amen. All right. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll look at verse 27, guys, in a minute. 1 Corinthians 9, every Christian, you're born again, you're brand new, you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, old things have passed away, but every Christian, every day, has the flesh to contend with. I said every Christian, every day, has the flesh to contend with. Amen? And so uh, the flesh wants to do and say things that are not Christ-like, that are not holy. Now when I think of the flesh... Don't just think about some kind of, you know, sexual lust. That, that's, the, that's the flesh. But the flesh doesn't want to love. The flesh doesn't want to forgive people. The flesh wants to retaliate. The flesh wants to repay evil for evil and reviling for reviling. In other words, the flesh wants to talk bad about other people. It wants to gossip about people, gossip about people. It wants to portray people in a bad light. The flesh doesn't want to submit to godly authority. The flesh is rebellious. <laughs> The flesh is selfish. The flesh desires wrong things. The flesh is lazy. The flesh isn't diligent. The flesh is lazy. And you could just go on and on and on and on. So you're sitting there looking at me like a calf at a new gate, but you have the flesh just like I have the flesh, and your flesh wants to do wrong things. <laughs> it wants to say wrong things sometimes. Isn't that true? Amen. And, 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 and there's a myth that no matter how much we say it, people still have this myth that if I become spiritual enough, if I develop enough faith and become really spiritual, that I'll never even be tempted again. But that's not true. As long as you are here on the earth, you will have the devil to deal with, you will have the flesh to contend with, and you will have to say no to the flesh, and you'll have to resist the devil. Amen. You know, it was like the old story that came to the front and said, would you pray for me that I'd never be tempted again? And the pastor started praying that he would die. And the man said, what are you doing? He goes, well, that's the only way you're never going to be tempted is if you die and you go to heaven. <laughs> Amen. So we understand that. Every Christian, say every Christian. Every, every, Christian. Day, every, every day. Has the flesh to contend with. The and the flesh wants to do wrong. The flesh wants to sin. And unholy, wrong thoughts will come to our minds. You don't have to be out seeking them. You're just driving down there. They will come to your mind. So we have to keep our bodies under. We have to reject wrong thoughts. There's a lot of different ways you can say it. The Bible expresses it in many different ways. We have to walk in the spirit. We have to keep our body under. We have to crucify the flesh. We have to say no to the flesh. We have to uh, let the new man on the inside dominate the flesh, the outward man, the body. We have to uh, uh, let that happen. We have to put on, the Bible says in Ephesians and Colossians, the new man. Amen. But victory over the flesh, listen to me very carefully, because I'm just getting to where I want to go to here. Victory over the flesh begins with, it doesn't end, but it begins with knowing that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus and you've got a brand new nature full of God's love. Amen. Hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 27, Paul said, but I discipline my body I, interesting, I, he's talking about the man on the inside, the man that's been born again, that new creature, 
that new creation that's, that's alive with the life of God and alive with the, with the nature of God, that's filled with love. I discipline my body and bring it. Notice he called his body it. He said, I bring it into subjection. He knew that he was not a body. You are not a body. You are a spirit. You have a body. See, most people tend to think of them things of, of, of having a spirit. You don't have a spirit. You are a spirit. And you have a body. You live in a body. So Paul says, look, I got to keep this. I got to discipline this body. And I got to bring it into subjection. Why? Because it wants to do things wrong. Amen. The man on the inside, the new creation, he says, I keep my body under. Glory to God. So listen now. The great apostle Paul's body wanted to do some things that were wrong. If you count pages, Paul wrote almost two-thirds of the New Testament. And this great man of God, this man so greatly and wonderfully used of God, said that his flesh, his body, wanted to do some, some things that were wrong. There's nothing evil about you inherently because your flesh wants to sin and wants to do wrong or because you can be tempted. I don't care if you raised three people from the dead last week. You can be tempted today. Are you listening to me? But a lot of people, you know, the devil tries to convince people, no, you're, you're ugly, you're wicked because you even had the thought. He brought the thought to you, then he condemns you for having the thought. <laughs> we got we to gotta be better spiritually educated than that, can you say amen? So again, the great apostle Paul's body wanted to do some things that were wrong. That's why he, the new creation, had to keep his body under. He would not have to keep it under if, he, if it didn't want to do some things that were wrong. Brother Hagin said, the holiest saint that ever lived has thoughts that come to their head that their heart resents. Why don't you just go over there and tell them off? And a thousand other things, 10,000 other things. You know, I was talking along these lines right here in this very building. This is the, you know, been in different buildings over the years. But, and there was a man right back here. He was, well, he's probably younger than I am now, but he was close to 70. And I was talking about this and particularly reading this scripture about Paul had to keep his body all under. And he walked up to me and he had tears rolling down his eyes, out of his eyes, down his face. And he'd come to church every time the doors were open. Before he came to this church, he had been involved in other churches his whole life, basically. He said, all my life I felt like a total failure. I felt guilty. I felt unworthy because I did not understand this because there was a part of me that at times wanted to do evil, that wanted to do wrong. And I thought, what's the matter with me? What's the matter with me? He said, I realized this morning that's just my flesh. It's not who I really am. And it set him free. I said, it set him free. Glory to God. So don't be surprised if your flesh wants to do wrong things. Don't be surprised if your flesh doesn't want to forgive. Amen. And don't think that those wrong desires are your desires. Don't let the devil condemn you. He tempts you to do th wrong. He brings wrong thoughts to your mind. And understand something, Satan works in this natural realm. He works through your emotions. He works through your thoughts. He works through your feelings. He can bring th wrong thoughts to your mind. He can make you feel things. And so because Christians do have the flesh that wants to do wrong and can be tempted with wrong thoughts and can have thoughts come to their mind, that they're, that to their head that their heart resents, and because they can feel like they're evil, he can make you feel that way, the devil will tell people, you must not be saved at all. Or, what's wrong with you? You're saved, all right, but what's wrong? You're a pathetic Christian. You're, you, if, you, you're, you, if you was really saved, you wouldn't act that way. Or, or if you were really spiritual, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that thought. You wouldn't think that well. You wouldn't want to do that thing. And he will insinuate using your feelings, using emotions, using uh, the natural world, using thoughts and temptations, that the real you, the new creation on the inside, wants to sin. Dear friend, that is a lie. That is a lie. The real you, the inward you, the new creation, doesn't ever want to do wrong. 
Dr. Yeoman said, I, I've read this several times, but I like it so much. This is, she, you know, she was a wonderful woman of faith, wrote this book back in the late 1800s, actually. She says, when Jesus died, you died. You know, we sang about that a little bit this morning. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. When Christ died, and you, when you accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you died. That old sin nature died, and you were raised to new life. You were born again. When he was raised, you were raised, and you became a new creation. Born again, hallelujah. He said, when Jesus died, you died. Death is separation. Your, your death in Christ separated you from all your old evil nature. Listen, Satan will come and bring you some evil things and he has the power to make you feel them and tries to make you believe they are the same old things you used to have. They are not. Tell Satan that Jesus separated you from these old things and that you refuse to have these from Satan because God says, neither give place to the devil. You must believe, everybody say believe. You must believe that you are separated from the old evil things, even if you feel them in all your power. I've been reading after her, Dr. A.B. Simpson, and a lot of the, 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 the champions that started the Pentecostal movement you know, in the early 1900s, great men of faith, great women of faith, people that believed in divine healing, people that, that taught on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But when it came to this thing of dealing with the flesh, they all realized and understood that you have the flesh to deal with, you have the flesh to contend with, and the devil can make it feel like it's you, but they all, in essence, and they say, it's not you, it's not you, it's just the lies of the devil. And it's extremely important that you don't believe that it's you, but you believe that Jesus set you free. That's the great key to overcoming. And so she said, you must believe that you are separated from the old evil things, even if you feel them in all their power. You must believe you have the holy things of Christ in you when you cannot find one of them. God's law to everybody is, as you have believed, so be it unto you. And you know it is unto you as you believe? She said, God will make the things you believe Jesus separated you from leave you entirely as you believe and refuse to let your members serve them. Can you say amen? amen? So let's look at Romans 6, 6 here. Romans 6. There are a thousand things you can do. Many of them are scriptural and you should do. Make no provision for the flesh. Have an accountability partner. on and on and on and on. But none of those things will help you unless you first believe that Jesus set you free. That you're a new creature in Christ Jesus and Satan has no power over you. Demons have no power over you. Lust has no power over you. Evil has no power over you. You've been born again. So Romans 6, 6 says, knowing, notice he says knowing. If you don't know this, it won't do you any good. He says, knowing that our old man, that's your old sin nature. The old man, the old sin nature was crucified with him. Your old sin nature that, that, that made you a sinner by nature. In other words, you couldn't help yourself. You were like a leopard that couldn't change his spots. That sin nature was going to come out. You might restrain it because of societal restraints, because of morals, because you don't want to look ugly in front of your friends, but you had a sin nature. That old sin nature, knowing, knowing, knowing that our old sin nature was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Body of sin simply means that, that sin will not rule over you anymore. Your old sin nature, excuse me, was crucified so that sin might not rule over you anymore. For he who has died has been freed from sin. And then verse number 11 says, Likewise, reckon, very important words, the faith word, Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin. To be dead to sin means that sin has no more control over you. Sin has no more power over you. The flesh still wants to sin, but it has no power over you. It cannot control you anymore. Reckon that. Believe that. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. Alive to God is another way of saying you've been born again. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You're not just dead to sin. You're alive. You're born again. You're a new creature. Amen. You're a brand new species of being. 
filled with the life and nature of God that wants to live a holy, justified, righteous life. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but you are under grace. Amen. Glory to God. So there's much to say here, much to say here. You could break it all down. But let me just summarize this. Our new nature is alive to God and dead to sin, meaning that sin absolutely has no power over our lives. That will not help you, even though it's the truth, unless you believe it. And the devil does his best. What does he always do? He comes to challenge the word. Half God said he wants you to believe something that's not the truth concerning your healing, concerning your finances, concerning your relationships, and concerning this area. It's no different. So, don't let, because sin has no power over you, don't you let, don't you allow sin to rule over you. But it's in first believing, very carefully, very carefully, it's in first believing these truths that you are empowered by the Spirit to keep the flesh under. In other words, you can't do it unless you first believe these truths. You can keep the flesh under, uh, under because sin's power has been broken over your life. You don't break sin's power by being good, by keeping some commandments, by trying to do good, by trying to have strong wind power. No, you don't break sin's power by doing those things. You say no to sin because you can, because Jesus set you free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you must believe that. Here's something I read several times by Andrew Womack, and then I just read it a couple of days ago, and I, I said, you know, I, I finally, you know, I read it and thought it was interesting, but then it hit me what he's saying. You know, facts, truths, whether spiritual or natural, do not govern your life. Facts do not govern your life. What you believe governs your life. What you believe governs your life. He said, it's your knowledge or perception of truths that control your emotions. See, if you believe there's something that's not true, you'll have emotions that say that it's true. It's your knowledge or perception of truths that control your emotions and experiences. You know what Proverbs 23, 7 says? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. If someone lied to you, it's a horrible example, but it makes a good point. It's a good example, but it's... If someone lied to you about a family member having just died, you would experience great sorrow and other negative emotions, even though there was no factual basis to feel that way. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. There's been a horrible mistake. The police somehow get it wrong, but they knock on your door and tell you that your teenage son just died in a car accident. That your cousin died. That your mother was killed. And, and they, it's a mistake. It's a lie. It's not true. But they think it's true. And they tell you it's true. Think of all the terrible emotions and sorrow that you would begin to experience. You would be experiencing sorrows and emotions connected to something that's not true. But it would sure seem true. It would sure feel true. Are you listening carefully? Likewise, Brother Andrew, the power of sin is broken over our lives. But the fact, that fact won't change our experience until we know it, believe it, and act accordingly. Wow. There's a hundred things I tell people that they should do, and, and you should, you should, you should do, you should do keep your flesh under, but it begins here. So if you believe something that's not true, you'll have emotions and feelings that back up the lie you believe. Rick Renner was told, Rick Renner's one of the most brilliant people I have ever been around. He's, he's extremely intelligent. I'm sure he has an extremely high IQ, has wrote dozens and dozens of books, uh, serious works, you know, not, not fluff. I mean, not just serious works. And his, you know, he, he had a teacher tell him that he was a dumbbell, that he was old, dumb Rick Renner, and he believed that for years, and he acted like what he believed. But when he saw the truth, it set him free. 
and change the way he acted. So if we, if we believe something that's not true, you'll have emotions and feelings that back up the lie you believe. Faith in the truth that you are a new creation with a new nature. You're alive to God with his nature, his life, his love on the inside of you, his power on the inside of you. You're dead to sin. Faith in the fact, that the truth that you're dead to sin, the power of sin is broken in your life, makes it possible to say no to the flesh. Yes, 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 it is, it is, it is our responsibility to say no to the flesh. You can't do that for me. I can't do that for you. God will not do that for you. It's your responsibility to keep the flesh under. It's my responsibility. It's your responsibility, as Romans 12, 1 says, to present our bodies a living sacrifice to God. Again, I like what Andrew Womack said. He said, the problem with those living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. But that's our responsibility. I understand that. Glory to God. But we don't break sin power, sin's power over our lives because of our human efforts. No, Jesus did that for us. Jesus gave us a brand new heart. Quit identifying with the wrong things. Identify with who you are in Christ Jesus. Believe in that. Let that rule and reign in your life. Jesus gave you a new heart, a new nature. Our victory is based on believing what Jesus did for us. It's based on grace. It's from the outside in, not the outside in, outside in. It's believing in what God did for us in the inner man and letting what's on the inside manifest on the outside and not just trying to say no to fleshly desires. Human effort couldn't save us and human efforts can't make us holy. So a key here, and we're almost finished here. A key here is Romans 6, 11. Reckon, reckon. Everybody say reckon. reckon. We understand that. I reckon so. <laughs> Reckon's an old English word. We are to reckon ourselves to be deed. Notice what it says. Reckon yourselves indeed to be dead to sin. Not just reckon yourselves dead to sin, but indeed. That means in reality, without question. Don't question this. This is a fat jack. Reckon yourselves to be dead, meaning that sin no longer has any power over you. I like reading after Warren Wiersbe, good Baptist man. He said, reckon simply means to believe that what God says in his word is really true in your life. Best definition of reckon I've ever heard. You believe what God says in his word is true in your life. I reckon myself healed. I reckon myself uh, full of the love of God. I reckon myself blessed. I reckon myself dead to sin. I reckon that sin has no power over me. Paul didn't tell his readers to feel as if they were dead to sin or even to understand it fully, but to act on God's word and claim it for themselves. Reckoning is a matter of faith and issues and actions. He tells us that we are dead to sin and alive unto God and then commands us to act on it, even if... even. In Excuse me. Even if we do not act on it, the facts are still true. Oh, glory to God. And then I read something by Dr. A.B. Simpson. Now, he's making the point that after you in faith believe something, or because he particularly he talks about anything, but he particularly talks about after you in faith reckon yourself, consider yourself to be dead to sin, no matter how you feel, that you should not think it strange that an onslaught from the enemy comes against you to deny that truth. In other words, you, you, you take a step of faith and you may begin to experience a storm of circumstances and thoughts and feelings from the devil that say it's not true. Anybody ever experienced that? You take that stand of faith and everything declares that it's not true. It doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't seem true, it doesn't feel true, it doesn't look like true. And then he says, and, and I'm quoting from a devotional Margaret got these old devotionals and they're really, really good. Let us quite understand what we mean by temptation. You especially who have stepped out with the assurance, that's confidence, that's faith, who have stepped out with the confidence or assurance that you have died to sin may be greatly amazed to find yourself assailed or attacked with a tempest of thoughts and feelings that seem to come wholly from within you. Here's this great man of faith. You know, he, he's one of the founding fathers, really, of the, uh, of, of the four-square 
I mean, the, the four square and the assemblies of God, really, and even. But he's saying, you know, you, you may feel like this isn't true at all. He, he understood that. He's a human being. He has the flesh to contend with just like you have the flesh to contend with. And he said that, and he's saying, you know, that, that's what trips people up so much is that they feel like they have to do something or they, 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 they wonder why their flesh wants to do wrong. All of that, you see. And he's saying, so you may be attacked. At, uh, you know, I smoked from when I was 18 years. I played, you know, I, I grew up in the 50s and 60s and, you know, everybody smoked. You know, Andy Griffith on some of the early shows, he'd light up a cigarette. Probably Aunt B smoked. She never smoked on TV, but, you know, she, she might have smoked. Who knows? Lucy smoked. Everybody smoked. My parents quit, but nonetheless, I was associated with it. I was around it. I was intrigued by it. And I, you know, played around with it. Picked up cigarette butts as a 13-year-old kid. Took them out in the middle of the woods. Took off my shirt. Found out which way the wind was blowing. You know, <laughs> took a puff and held it way out here. And walked in the door, and my mother said, Who's been smoking? <laughs> they know, they know. <clears throat> so I played around, and you know, by the time I get a little older and go to college and so forth, I, I smoke a pack a day for years. Now, I'm a, I'm a born again Christian. But, it, but, but if you would have asked me, it felt like, it seemed like, I was born to smoke cigarettes, that I was born with this innate desire to suck smoke down my lungs. I was not. But it seemed like it. It felt like it. But that was not true. That was not true. Hope you're listening. You especially who have stepped out with the assurance that you have died to sin may be greatly amazed to find yourself assailed with a tempest of thoughts and feelings that seem to come wholly from within. And you will be impelled to say, why I thought I was dead, but I seem to be alive. This, beloved, is the time to remember that in temptation, the instigation, what is instigation? That means the impulse to do wrong, the encouragement to do to evil, this is the time to remember that the temptation, that in temptation, the impulse to do wrong, the encouragement to do evil, the instigation to do evil is not your sin, but only the voice of the evil one. You got to know that. You got to remember that. And you have to believe this is not who I am. This is not me. I want to love. I want to forgive. I don't want to commit this, you know, whatever it is. I've been born again, and I will not receive that as being me. It's not me. The real me is alive and to God. And then he quotes a poem, and I'll not go into the po poem because it's poetic and 18th century, and you know. But the bottom line thing of the poem is here's somebody in the midst of a terrible storm and so forth, and things are going bad, and the captain of the ship is saying, the reason things are going bad is because you let down your shield of faith. In other words, you quit believing what God's word said about you. That's why it's not working. That's, yeah, anybody can go through a storm. That's not the point. But this storm and this poem is defeating them. It's threatening their lives and, 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 and it's controlling their lives. And he's saying the reason it is is because you let down your shield of faith. And so A.B. Simpson then comes back and says, listen, the problem is not the storm per se. It's, uh, it's not the emotions, the, the storm of emotions that you're facing, the lies that you're facing, the feelings and thoughts that say it's not so, that scream is not so. It, it, it's believing those lies that causes defeat. So keep believing what God says and that, you, that is that you are a new creature in Christ Jesus and sin has no more ruling control or authority over you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I close with this. Uh, this is from another commentary. He's talking about the exact same things we're talking about in Romans 6. You know, reckon yourself dead to sin. Know that your old man is dead and so forth. And, and you understand, uh, you may not know this. Maybe nobody in here knows it. But if you go back almost 100 years, I used to tell a lot of Pat and Mike jokes. Anybody ever hear a Pat and Mike joke? Well, they used to tell them. <laughs> Pat and Mike were Irish, two, two Irish boys. So they'd tell, it was like Woodrow and Thibodeau. Everybody ever hear those from Louisiana? Yeah, it's kind of like that, you know. And so, 
It's the same with the great biblical truth that the believer is dead with Christ. He may not feel very dead. See, see people in the know understand this. He may not feel very dead, but that is quite beside the point. God says that he is, and the whole machinery of redemption declares it to be a fact. How slow we are to believe this great basic fact, which opens for us the door to victorious Christian living. The story is told of two Irishmen, Pat and Mike, who found a most unusual turtle. The animal's head had been completely severed from its body, but the turtle was still running around as though nothing had happened. Pat maintained that it was dead, but Mike denied it stoutly, and the argument waxed louder and louder until presently along came O'Brien. They decided that O'Brien should arbitrate the matter and that his verdict would be final. O'Brien took one look at the remarkable turtle and said, it's dead, but it don't believe it. <laughs> That's exactly the problem with many Christians. They are dead you do have the ability to say no to the flesh. They are dead, but they do not believe it. This is a tragedy, for it is this truth, or the truth of this, fully and unreservedly believe that breaks sin's stranglehold in the life once it is believed. Amen? Let's stand up together. So we are to believe we are a new creation. It's fact jacked. We are a new creation, brand new. New inner nature. Old nature, old sin nature has gone away. I don't care how many failures you've had, don't identify with that. Identify with the new man you are in Christ Jesus, the new woman you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. We're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away. And believe that sin has no power over you. And then, yes, do your bit, do your responsibility. Say no to sin. Keep your body under. I remember an old, old song written by David Ingalls. David Ingalls still alive, still kicking, still doing good. You know, he, was, he had some fame in writing songs and uh, a couple of country hits that he wrote. And then he got around Brother Hagin, began to learn some of these truths. And he wrote a lot of songs, you know, their style back in the day of the 70s and 80s. But he wrote a song called I'm a New Creation. Anybody remember that song? I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. So you do. Old things are passed away. I am born again. More than a conqueror, that's who I am. I'm a new creation, I'm a brand new man. Oh, hallelujah, he redeemed me. I am born again to win. He wrote a song, you know, born to lose. <laughs> He's, oh, hallelujah, he redeemed me. I'm born again to win. I thank God he justified me. Of his fullness have we all received of him. Then he says, I've received the Christ of Calvary. I have no sense of sin. We have a oneness and a fellowship delivered from the authority of sin. Do you believe it? Sing it. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things are passed away. I am born again. More than a conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. The other verse, God has wrought for me victory. One that covers every need. Perfectly he restored our fellowship with no sense of guilt or memory. In Christ Jesus, we should not have, we don't have any guilt. There's no condemnation. Glory to God. We have no shame. We're delivered from the authority of sin. We're born again to win and sin and death and demons and sickness and disease and fear and depression and anything else that comes from the devil has no power over us. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. I'm born again to win. Yes. Hallelujah. And I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what. See, if, if, I could, if I could make you feel like you were something that you're not, then you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to be controlled by that. 
That's why it's all important to believe the truth, especially in this day and age. It's important that we know that this is the truth. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, and the truth shall keep you free. And this is the truth indeed. Sing it again. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Old things are passed away. I am born again. More than conqueror. That's who I am. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. Glory to God. Now celebrate over that a little bit. Praise God about that. Thank God for that. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Glory to God. 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 Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad, I'm glad when, when, you, when, when that a lot of people's experience when they first get saved is they, they have such a glorious experience in Christ Jesus. It's just like certain things just, just fall off of them. Glory to God. But that isn't everybody's experience. And even if something, even, even if somebody that's, a, that's an alcoholic just instantly be, doesn't, never has another desire for alcohol, they still have to keep the flesh under in other areas. They still have to walk in love and forgive. Amen. Man, I came back and rededicated my life to God and was cleansed of all unrighteousness and, and that, that kind of broke the curse of that cigarettes over me because, because I was in the process for the 150th time of trying to quit. Don't tell me how to quit. I know how to quit. I did it 150 times. <laughs> Be riding around in my police car, you know. I mean, I ain't got a dime. I ain't got a penny. You know, sometimes you'd bum, bum a cigarette off, off somebody. Then you say, you got a light? And they'd look at you and say, you don't have anything but the habit, do you? Because I didn't have any money. So, so I ain't got any money, you know. And I'm hooked on cigarettes. Don't want to admit that to myself, but I'm hooked. And so I, I work on the evening shift, you know, so I ride around and I throw those cigarettes out the window. An hour later, I'm out there with my flashlight trying to find those <laughs> cigarettes. Brother, that's bondage. But I had requit again, and I'd gone seven or eight weeks without smoking and I just started to bum a cigarette here and there and, and now all of a sudden, glory to God, I rededicated my life to God and it's, it's like I got saved all over again. I got gloriously rededicated to God and that just broke the power of that over my life. I wish everything else had been that easy. I can still smell a cigarette. Most of, most of the time when I see a cigarette, I just go, mm. Just turns my stomach. But every once in a while I get a certain waft of smell and I can go, yeah, I could do that. Isn't that funny? If I'd have never started, I'd have never had those problems. But I don't care if you've been walking with the Lord for years and years and years and years and years and just feel like something's got a hold of you and the flesh has given you a fit in some particular area. It's not you. Just, just stay straight with God. Rise up. Know that you're free. Believe that you're free. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Meditate in these scriptures. Meditate in these scriptures till they can't beat them out of you with a baseball bat. Hallelujah. And never, never, never accept defeat in any area. Can you say amen? amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is dear to my heart. It always has been. It's real early, so, you know, you can, you can, you're okay. Went to a minister's meeting one time. It's one of those basic youth conflicts actually done by Bill Gothard, you know, very famous in his day. Baptist type ministers there. Somebody invited me to go. I went. It's a wonderful day, wonderful experience. And, and he talked about how to overcome the power of sin in your lives. And he had wrote a little book about that. And I almost got trampled to death getting that book at the end of the service. You say, isn't that wonderful? All those preachers wanted to get back there and get that book so they could help their, their parishioners. They're getting back there to get that book so they could help themselves. We all have the flesh to contend with. But Jesus set us free. Come on, Miss Morgan. Thank you, Jesus. 
You know, it's funny, I had sent this to uh, Mark a few days ago, which he had marked, he didn't read it today, but I wanted to read it to you because um, there's something I want to say about it. But it's also from A.B. Simpson. And he said, this word reckon is one of the key words of scripture. It's the same word used about our being dead. And this is what he was just talking about. We are painfully conscious of something which would gladly return to life. But we are to treat ourselves as dead and neither fear nor obey the old man. Amen. And I wanted to point that one part out of neither fear nor obey. You know, we can be determined not to obey sometime, but that fear sort of tries to creep in there. But don't be afraid. Just stand in who you are in Christ and choose to not fear the old man. It's dead. Amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of that this morning? Amen. You walking with the Lord? Amen. Born again, saved, glory to God. Go and be doers of the word. That's the best thing I can tell you this morning. Just go and be doers of the word. Can you say amen? amen. Glory to God. Say, I'm a, doer of the word. I'm a doer of the word. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. Praise God.